getting started. So uh, same thing, auto classification can work, and um, and but there are many things uh, against making this work. And it's the bats themselves, how they vary their calls, um, just within uh, the tasks that they're performing, and also when they're around other bats and other bats are interacting with them. The recording conditions uh, vary from site to site, place to place, night to night. Uh, the recording deployment, how and where you put out your microphone, uh, really matters. And uh, differences in the hardware. All these things conspire to create a sort of garbage in, garbage out um, uh, proposition. And uh, what I want to uh, just fundamentally, let's all understand that this is difficult work. There are little nuances that the bats give us, and the more and better data that we can start with and, and consistency in what we do, the better results we can get. And so I'm also confront, often confronted with situations like this, where um, somebody will get me a file and say, Joe, <laughs> can you identify this bat for me? And, and uh, well, I look at that and then you know, zoom into it, look at it at high resolution as we uh, do on Sonic Bat, and, and this is what's there. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, uh, come on, I record this. It's a bat. Tell me what kind it is. And, and really, this is, this is what I call acoustic mush. <laughs> and it's just, just a smear up there. And you know, so it's, like, it's, it's amazingly easy to produce recordings like this. <laughs> And, and you look at it, zoom in on there, and it's like, well, yeah, there's a bat, and I can start telling you sort of what frequency range it is, and it's that. And, and so, yeah, well, this is disappointing, especially for people who have, like, you know, spent maybe a long recording session, and, this is, and then they look at their data and start to learn some of these fundamental things. So you know, there's a steep learning curve in this, and, and a lot of us have, have, have suffered the pain of it. <laughs> um, but you know what? What really? But pain, pain on my side is when people, uh, you know, get recordings like this, and then people come back to me and say, "Joe, it's not a bad, doesn't work." <laughs> and it's like, okay, send me a file, uh, to see what you got, and and then and then what do you get? It's like I get stuff like this coming out of them. It's like you know, this is world class mush, and and then or something like this, and and so if we, if we look into this. And then it's like, well, yeah, of course Sonobat's not going to work because Sonobat's recognizing that that's mush and, and that you can't confidently do this because Sonobat is, is uh, uh, built up to try to uh, replicate what we as humans do when we're looking at these files. And so if we as a human look at this file, and this is uh, the view that Sonobat does a compressed view to try to like just sort the calls out in there. So it's good enough it actually found the calls in this. But if we look at it a full, a real-time view, you can see it's just these these little pulses, they're separated and you know, buried in the noise. And if we zoom in on one of those, we can kind of see that there's a little bit of call there uh, and then a lot of trailing stuff after that, and that's echoes. And so uh, we should understand what makes recordings come out like this, uh, because we need to understand what makes them come out like this to prevent them from coming out like this. And uh, first thing to understand is that uh, distance obscures details. And when bats are really close to us, we're going to get good, strong, crisp signals, and we'll get the full extent of the signal the bat's producing. As the bat's farther away from us, we get less of it. We get what are called fragments, not the entirety of the signal the bat produces from us. And um, first, first lesson of ultrasound is that ultrasound are very short waves, and they attenuate much more faster. So they don't travel as far in the atmosphere as well, we have an intuitive perception of sound. Uh, you all the way back in the room, if you were a bat talking to me, you would not hear me. Oh, can you even hear me at all? I'm going to close my mic. Okay. And, and so, uh, lesson one is that the sound, the sound attenuation is greater with ultrasound than normal sound. And that if we look at the, the distance the bats uh, come to our microphone, if we're out one unit, rate, one unit uh, away from the microphone, and we look at the volume of airspace occupied by bats there, that's where we get our really, really great uh, signals. If you go out one additional uh, unit, the um, area that you have there, here, this is a laser, right? Red. Okay, I don't want to get my eye here. Red button. The red button at the top. No. Oh, oh, oh. That one. Okay. So if we go out two units, the, the, the volume that's in that shell compared to the volume in that first unit radius is seven times the volume. And if you go out uh, three units radius, the volume in that outer shell is 19 times. And so for the bats as, that are in the, you know, giving an even distribution in space around our microphone, even coverage, then you're going to record many, many more low signal, not very good files comparatively. So when you go out and record, it's just the nature of, of the situation. 
And so when we get this, it's like, all right, I'm going to um, try to get the maximum amount of data out of these calls. So this is a challenging enough proposition, and so um, let's try to get as much data out of this as possible. And apologies to Ian and, and Chris, but um, I, I'm going to get every little bit, even if it's a 5 dB advantage, I want it. And we're trying to do the best out of this. And if we're looking at trying to get the data out of the calls, the call shape, then if we do it all the way and, and actually use shape functions and, and recognition algorithms to try to follow the shape of these calls to get the most accurate trend as possible out of them. And if you've got really good clean calls, which you should be getting, and I'll give you some tips in a moment, then the shape of the call that you can get out of zero crossing and the full spectrum, um, you know, more hard earned shape driven tra training analysis is going to give you very similar shape to the calls. Albeit we're going to get a much finer scale and, and better data out of there. And, but the differences really come when you start having those, those uh, dB differences and interaction with other signals. So if we look at um, some of the signals that are out in that, you know, like three times uh, unit radius volume, we start getting more and more fragments when we don't, when we're not able to follow it through into the very low uh, amplitude levels that we can using um, the full data that's available in these recordings. And so here's a, here's a couple of examples here uh, that we look at the, the zero cross rendering of these, and these are even good clean calls, it's just they're limited by the amplitude available in them that we can see and get the full results out of this when we're working with it. And you know, better data, better results is the tack that I take. Uh, when you've got a little noise collection, and, and if you've got good clean signals, it's easy to differentiate if you have a lot of overlapping ones. But when you start getting these, these acoustic mushes, it's, it's much more difficult to take that out. And we can still dig into these and you know, see the difference between this fragment coming out looking like a turning up red bat versus a turning down myotis, or a, a hoary bat that would be turning up versus actually a free-tailed bat where it's turning down at the end. We can sort some of these things out. So uh, what we really want to try to do, though, is to get start off with as good a data as possible. You know, good, clean, crisp, well-recorded calls versus the, these mushy, poorly recorded calls. And uh, the best uh, the way to avoid this, and what's generating all of this, is uh, what are bats doing? They're putting out these loud signals so they can get echoes back. And so it's these echoes that you're getting back as well that are all interacting. And the process uh, that creates this it's called it's constructive and deconstructive interference. And so you've got a bat flying over the water in this case, and you get this one direct signal that goes from the bat to your microphone. And if you've got a nice big flat surface, you're going to get another signal that's bouncing off the water and going up to your microphone. This is a bit longer pathway, and so it arrives a little bit later. And so here's a case where we have two clear echoes. It's what we call a specular echo. In this case, it's just, just coming from one flat source. And so we can actually see the two echoes. And you can actually see where it's interacting here. It makes this like cone-like pattern in there. And that's from um, being slightly out of phase and varying between a constructive interference where the two signals are additive to each other and then a deconstructive interference where they're canceling each other out. And it becomes clear in a situation like this. So anytime that you have two, two or more different waves, you're going to get a summative wave of them, which is resultant from all of their interactions. Now, um, it's a little bit clearer in this case, but still it's, it's not as easy to say exactly where that call ends. And so when the bats are closer to surfaces, we can't avoid that. When the bats are up in the air, there's a lot we can do to avoid this situation. And if you go out and make what is um, um, so, somewhat of a, shall we say, beginner's mistake, which is to just put your microphone right down on the ground, then you're going to get a, basically a shower of echoes from all these multiple surfaces coming to the microphone, interacting with that one direct wave that's coming towards you. And that's how you, that's how you generate acoustic mush. So anytime you want to do this, this is all you have to do. But you don't want to do this. And so the way you present, prevent this is you get your microphone up away from the ground. And knowing that uh, sound travels at 340 meters per second, that means in, in, um, it'll travel one meter in about 2.9 milliseconds. So if you get your microphone just up two meters away from any surface, uh, the more, the better, then you're going to um, give it at least you know, 12 milliseconds away from when any of these echoes could arrive. And that gives time for your 
direct signal to get in your microphone and be recorded without getting interfered and then have that constructive and deconstructive interference coming from any other surfaces. And so that is how you avoid the mush and you get a good clean signal of just that signal. And so just to give you some examples here, um, that's, you know, just, you know, wherever you are, you know, get your microphone up, just get it up a little bit. Uh, walking around with the detector in your hand, you're going, you're going to be the surface that's showering um, it with um, confounding echo clutter. Uh, but getting your microphone up and away, it's, it's getting my from now. Of course, you can't avoid the bat being close to the water um, producing an echo. So the bats are moving about in, in the spatial um, realm, and they're going to produce more echoes. But you, um, you can do a lot by preventing uh, echoes that would be coming from all of them. So these bats up over the close to the water produce echoes, but when they get off, off the water, they'll give you good clean calls. So, um, better data produces better results, and that's what we should all be endeavoring to do, uh, because that it's challenging enough to tell these bats apart, and it's challenging to tell the bats apart because the bats themselves are varying their signals. And if we look at you know a call repertoire, these are red bats, you know, going from bats short calls in clutter to open claw uh, calls in uh, open air, and if we look at just their uh, call duration here versus the um, characters at frequency where they come down to, we can build these scatter plots for all of our species, and we see that there's quite a range of, of call types, and just pick out two of them, uh, big brown bats and silver hair bats here, we can see uh, that they have a lot of overlap. There, there are some distinctive call types in there, but then there are uh, parts where they overlap. And so when we do the process of working out, understanding, you know, trying to tell them apart, we're looking for the, the, the data types that are unique to one species to use to discriminate and say with confidence that, that, that a big brown or silver hair is there. But when we get into this mushy part in the middle, then we have to use more probabilistic methods. So it's like we can tell these pretty well apart, but all there in the middle where they're sharing characteristics becomes more of a probabilistic process. For some species like this, we've got some examples that we can use to be confident, and some that not. And here's our, here's our poster child for like really difficult species, these two eastern species here. And um, when we, uh, there were some data sets that um, earlier that showed, looked like we could tell them apart, but um, our work and others uh, had trouble being able to tell them apart. And so we speculated maybe that the, what's going on here is that uh, it might be limited data sets that give you the illusion that you can tell these apart. And so we thought, well, what happens if you take a large data set and break it up into subsets and run classifiers, build classifiers off them? And sure enough, what happens is you get a range of performance values from those that are quite high. So if you just happen to build your classifier on ones like this, you would, you would think that, or be misled to think that you can really tell them apart. But maybe these ones are better representing uh, the actual situation. And you can get an impression of what's happening by then carrying this out with looking at um, more and more. So if we get larger and larger data sets, uh, we see it comes down and it converges. And it looks like it might be trending downward to sort of a meaningless 50% where it's a coin toss, which kind of, kind of is for those species. But um, what really like, we hope is happening is that it's just actually reaching an asymptote here. And that these ones are just happenstance, you know, getting it right. These ones aren't. And if you treat your data this way, if we, you know, when we're looking at it, you know, trying to get a notion of whether our classifiers are performing well, this is a good approach to being able to see if it's coming down to uh, a value where you're, you're narrowing down. So here's our, just a few more with them. Here's uh, the, the big brown bat silver hairs. You see it's better than what's going on with these, so we can tell those apart better. Here's an example of two of our, our western uh, myotis. Uh, that's going down. And if we compare these all together, uh, we can see some species we can do better than others. So it's like those guys, not so good. Um, silver hairs, big browns, better. And, and some species even better we can do. So this gives us, um, uh, as a, a, a way of evaluating classifiers. And uh, just to make this point that some of our species, we're gonna have much more confidence telling them apart and, and understanding these. And when you know, uh, can be confident as to what is your actual ultimate ability to tell these apart, 
then we can use those probabilistic methods with confidence like maximum likelihood estimates and all. With the caveat that it's actually going to be, you know, what we work out here is an ideal case, and when we come back with our recorded data for the field, it's going to be, you know, a, a mix of results in what is act, our actual confidence. But the better, the cleaner uh, data that we use, the better it's going to approach these ideal levels.